Good evening, everyone. Thank you for attending CVR's CME presentation this evening. Um, at this time, I would like to introduce Dr. Sanjeev Lakhampal, who will go over a few details about tonight's Venus Exchange. Okay, so I'm sorry, I was uh, muted all this time. So let me start all over again. Welcome everybody. Welcome to CBR's uh, CME program. Uh, we really appreciate you guys taking the time and uh, joining us. We will try to make this as productive as possible, as always. I'm gonna quickly start with some housekeeping things. Please mute yourself, uh, mute the microphones so that you do not disturb the presenter. We're really trying to make this something unique with its interactiveness. So we do want you to ask a lot of questions. We will try to get to every one of the questions during the program. If we cannot, time is a finite commodity, then your local six CBR physician will reach out to you with the answers. Again, there are plenty of videos you can watch. You can just go to YouTube and watch everything how this program, this CME program will be different is by its interactive nature. So please ask questions. Uh, you will receive your CME certificate, either the CBR liaison will bring you the certificate or you will get it digitally. All of our programs are selected based on your feedback. Please give us your feedback. Please give us more details about what Venus topic you would like to, us to expand upon. And similarly, today's topic is selected from all the requests that have come in. Great, sorry for these little technical glitches guys let's uh, the next slide so a quick introduction about CVR most of you are familiar with CVR the fact that you're taking the time to join us uh, at this time we really really appreciate it uh, Center for Vein Restoration now has about 95 centers throughout the country are the largest providers of vein care in the country and that is only possible because of your trust in Center for Vein Restoration vast majority of our patients are referred to us by our referring physicians and we are eternally grateful to you all for trusting us with your most important thing which is your patient uh, we also are very very proud of the fact that we are training the future of phlebology we have six phlebology training spots and uh, that keeps us honest that also makes sure our physicians are always on the cutting edge and uh, uh, you know we really take that responsibility very seriously just without all of these physicians these are center for vein restorations physicians every one of them contributes towards uh, teaching and education and what we are doing this evening would not be possible without the contribution of all of these physicians so just a quick recognition to everybody now our e is let me just uh, give you a little overview of what we are trying to do today. Dr. Kelsey, who is our regional medical director for Michigan West, she is going to be talking about uh, now the topic we've given is everything to know about DVT. Now, obviously, everything to know about DVT cannot be touched in one hour. It's a very, very vast topic. So what we've tried to do is Dr. Kelsey is going to frame this as an overall topic. And then we are over the next five, six presentations. We will take each part of her talk today and expand on that further with other physicians from Center for Vein Restoration. 
So with that, Dr. Kelsey, please uh, take over and uh, educate us on uh, everything we need to know about uh, deep venous thrombosis. I will pause share and now you will take share. Can you do this share? Bear with me. Okay, thank you, Sanjeev. Sorry about the technical issues well, here. We're all, we're all learning, believe me. So thank you. Thank you okay. for the great talk that you Okay, so with that introduction, what I'd like to do is give you a brief overview of how we're going to approach this massive topic. One is we're going to introduce the statistics to get you excited about why are we even having this conversation and why does Dr. Locke and Paul feel that we should give this so much airtime in terms of uh, promoting education in this field. The second thing is that we're going to familiarize you with the natural history of a, of a thrombus um, and that will really segue into uh, the rest of the conversation. We're gonna talk about risk prevention and risk stratification. As you know, 95% of these blood clots are preventable. So we can avoid having these conf uh, you know, conferences in the future if we can just get step one down. Step two, we'll talk about the management of venous thromboembolic events, both pulmonary embolus and DVT. And then finally, we're gonna to touch on recurrence versus bleeding risk and how to do prevention in the long term. So this is borrowed from the CDC website. These numbers really haven't moved uh, much in many years. And it's estimated that there's 900,000 cases of venous thromboembolic events per year. Uh, that's one to two per thousand adult people in our country. And the reason it's just an estimate is because we really don't know how many people are dying from blood clots because we don't do postmortem evaluations anymore. In 1975, there were 630 documented cases of pulmonary embolic events um, uh, is specifically uh, pulmonary embolus. Um, so we, again, these are just estimates. About 100,000 and some estimate up to 300,000 uh, patients die per year of a preventable disease. This is why the Surgeon General uh, was so aggressive uh, having this call to action in 2008. And he said, hey, you guys got to get out there and start talking about this um, because this is unnecessary. Of the patients that die, about 30% will die within one month of their diagnosis, and sudden death is the first symptom in 25% of these patients. And so it's not that we miss the diagnosis, we'll catch it tomorrow, it's that these folks die um, before we even have an opportunity to diagnose them. Uh, 30 to 50% will have long-term complications and 33% will have recurrent disease. We all know about the three factors, that it's a combination of things that leads to the blood clot, it's not one isolated event. And so we talk about vessel wall damage, maybe that's surgery. Um, you know, when they did elect electron microscopy on patients at the induction of surgery, they find that people that are paralyzed lose their muscle tone. The muscle really is a structural support for those deep veins. And so as that muscle relaxes, the, the vein stretches and that's the start of the platelets attacking that crack in the endothelial lining. Talk about altered blood flow status. Again, I pick on uh, the surgeons and immobilizations um, that can cause uh, more static blood flow. And then hypercoagulability can be a lot of things. It can be sepsis, it can be uh, you know, COVID, it can be uh, genetic mutations. And so that's a little beyond the scope of this. That's a whole separate uh, talk. But essentially thrombus forms typically at the venous sinuses, uh, most form actually in the caffeine. And the reason for that is there's a little, little turbulent flow in there and a decreased oxygen uh, tension. And so that starts this coagulation cascade. And then you'll see that platelets are usually the first line in there and then thrombin will come in and then more cells will join. And then you'll end up with these red and white uh, bands. And that's a board question always, the lines of Zahn. So you have red blood cells intermixed with fibrin in there. Um, platelets tend to be less numerous in the vein clots than they do in the arterial clots, but we will touch on aspirin and how it does play a critical role um, as it releases P-selectins. Um, and P-selectins recruit leukocytes, which is part of that whole inflammatory cascade, which we now believe is part of the reason for post-thrombotic syndrome. So what's the natural history of the life course of a DVT? Most of them, most of them start in the calf. Now you think, well, clearly they're gonna know if they have a clot, that's not true. 90% of clots that become symptomatic started in the calf, um, but only 
when they become proximal, do they start to present with symptoms? So the research shows that only about five to 12% of people with an isolated calf vein clot have symptoms. And again, the estimate here is because you have to really look at asymptomatic patients to really determine what uh, the true incidence is. When they looked at asymptomatic patients after a knee and hip surgery, they found that 15% of those folks had a blood clot. And then after a cabbage, 45% had a blood clot. Um, if you look at femoral line placements, about 50% of patients with central lines, especially femoral lines, will end up with a blood clot. 30% of patients with PIC lines have blood clots. So it's extremely, extremely common. Um, one third of the clots that go to the lung arise from these isolated blood clots. So now you have a patient that had knee surgery, has no symptoms, is going to physical therapy and dies at physical therapy from a pulmonary embolus. This should really impress upon you how important it is that we utilize these uh, risk assessment tools to prevent this in the first place. Um, and again, 20% of new DVT patients have an underlying cancer. And so when you have an unprovoked clot, certainly that should be on your differential diagnosis. So if a clot starts in the calf, what are its choices? It has the option to grow. That's called propagation. Um, about 30% of isolated calf vein thrombus will, or thrombi will propagate. And if untreated, they'll do it within a week. Um, the greatest risk of propagation is really within those first two weeks. So if you're a believer that an isolated gastroc vein clot shouldn't be treated, then serial ultrasound is recommended, especially for that two week window. If you see one of us that says, hey, this patient's had this clot for four to five weeks, um, the clot is starting to look more old, you know, doesn't look, doesn't have all the uh, criteria that we would say symptomatically on ultrasound and by history uh, is acute, maybe you would choose to watch those isolated caffeine clots. But the timing is really critical in how you assess that. And if you're going to elect to watch a clot, you have to do serial ultrasounds during that growth phase, which is a two week window. The clot also has the option just to break free and go to the lungs. Um, one third of all sudden deaths were due to PE when we actually did postmortems. And most of the patients that died do so in 30 minutes. Pulmonary embolus has been called the great masquerader because it's a diagnosis that's very difficult to make. Um, people don't always present with hemoptysis, chest pain, and shortness of breath. In fact, rarely does anybody present with that triad of symptoms. And so it's a, it's a tricky diagnosis and it's often missed. If they survive that and the clot stops propagating, it'll start to stabilize. And then your body will go through a process of fibrinolysis. And what happens here is that plasminogen that's circulating around uh, made through the liver, it's activated and it starts to release basically the kinases that start to break down the clot. And the degradation of, of fibrin by plasmin results in D-dimer. And so that's where you check the D-dimers in folks. It's an indication that there is some clot going on and some breakdown happening. If you see a clot breaking down, this is an example uh, of an acute clot. You'll see that this here is the vein wall. Here's the other vein wall. And this is all uh, on a longitudinal view, all thrombus. Over here, you'll start to see there's a little black, which is indicating some openings. And then the last picture here, you start to see that there's actually flow um, in that area, indicating that that is resolving. I tell my patients the clot will stabilize and it'll start to melt like a popsicle. This is typically what you'll see. And so when I'm giving people uh, information about their clots, we really pay a lot of attention to, is it partially thrombosed? Is it stuck to the wall or is it completely occluded? And when you're talking about resolution, you know, most of the clot is going to resolve in that three to six month window. And so at six months, a clot is really starting to be considered chronic in the clot rule because such, so much of the opportunity of resolution is already passed at that six month window. This is a transverse section and you see this really bright spot here. Um, and this is the artery next to it. Here's the vein. And this bright spot is a chronic clot. And so uh, when we go to compress it, it's mostly compressible, but you see that uh, little clot in there. Um, that's what a chronic thrombus looks like. Now, if the thrombus goes away and doesn't leave any damage, that's the best case scenario. And so veins have valves and the valves are really critical in keeping the venous system a low pressure system. When you have varicose veins, it's because the superficial valves are not working properly. When you have deep vein reflux, uh, it's usually due to those thrombi uh, leaving some sticky spots and those valves are slow to close. What happens instead of the blood going up in the vein, it starts to come down, generating a pressure. That pressure then blows through these perforators and moves out to the surface. 
pardon me, if you see a patient with a leg like this, this patient's likely had a blood clot or has some sort of venous insufficiency that needs to get to a vein specialist. Post-thrombotic syndrome has been studied, um, but it's a very large, broad diagnosis, and so more work needs to be done. It's estimated that, uh, you know, 20 to 70% of patients with symptomatic DVT, and again, symptomatic tends to indicate that it's more proximal, uh, those patients are going to have post-thrombotic syndrome within two to three years of the DVT. Here are some risk, risk factors that are known to be associated uh, with uh, post-thrombotic syndrome, and we know the more proximal the clot, the worse it is. This first picture here um, is a gentleman who had protein C deficiency and occluded both his deep systems all through his iliacs, all the way up to his vena cava and into his right atrium. And this poor gentleman would have pressure build up through his perforators and blow out these patches where he would just literally weep blood through these areas. We were able to successfully treat his perforators, but we can't correct the underlying problem for him. This is also a genetic uh, effector. Uh, let's see, this guy's protein S deficiency, and he has a recurrent ulceration, again, through perforator disease. And we'll get this fixed up and he'll be good for a couple of years. But again, he's in 30 to 40 millimeters of compression um, all the time. Um, the economic burden of this problem was 250 million in 2001. It was over a billion dollars in 2006. It's not insignificant. Now, it could just chronically obstruct. And this is a gentleman I saw in the office for a swollen leg. And you can clearly see what's going on here. His deep vein in his le leg was completely normal on ultrasound. That should prompt you to look up in the pelvis. And so when we did look up in the pelvis, we found um, this iliac clot. So this is an external iliac vein, external iliac artery. And then this is not his actual venogram, but this is what you would anticipate finding is that this uh, this vessel was occluded uh, in that area. Um, so it is recommended that those folks go forward with lytic treatment and possible stenting. So we know we don't want this problem, so what do we do to prevent it? So Caprini, you know, some people have issue with the different models that are out there. Some even say that it overestimates the risk of DVT, but the Caprini model is actually the most studied model that we have available. This is borrowed from Northwestern Health Center. Um, U of M uses the same one. Um, but basically this is a questionnaire and you check the boxes and you tally points and points equal risk, very simple. And the more points you get, the more risky it is. And so once you get to five points, um, you know, you're looking at doing some pharmacologic, uh, pharmacologic uh, prophylaxis. Now, if you look at these risk factors, uh, age over 40, uh, even a minor surgery, history of varic you know, if you have varicose veins, you already have three factors. Three factors on this model, again, puts you at a moderate risk. And I, I, I would say that most of us that do surgery or have a surgical background or people that are doing preoperative clearance would tack up these points pretty quickly and say, wow, it's very unlikely that we would find somebody that doesn't uh, benefit from mechanical prophylaxis or, uh, excuse me, pharmacologic prophylaxis. And the factor that's most forgotten is the family history of thrombosis. So if I don't have a clot, but my dad had a blood clot, that increases my risk by three points. So the risk assessment model for Caprini has been validated for general surgery, urology, vascular surgery. A revised model was done for bariatric patients and medical inpatients. And then in 2011, the University of Michigan studied this in plastic surgery patients. Plastic surgery patients are a unique group. This is our elective surgery group. And what they found is not only um, is there a high risk group, there's a, actually a super high risk group. So the more points you add, the more risky the procedure is, the more likely the blood clot is. The second thing that was discovered in this study is that the timing for prophylaxis isn't just at the induction of surgery, but really should extend um, throughout the patient's recovery until that patient um, is back basically to normal activity. Um, so here's a summation of those different uh, studies that were done. Um, the American College of Chest Physician Guidelines actually includes specific prophylactic recommendations based on pr procedure risk. The Caprini model also encourages you to look at the patient's risk. Um, and hospital EMRs now have hard stops on admission uh, for DVT risk assessment, and it will also populate what the suggested prophylaxis is. This was based on some studies that were done in 2007. 
the Endorse trial really looked at some of these big prominent hospitals um, and said, hey, let's look at your data. Let's see of the patients that are at risk, how many times are you prophylacting the patients appropriately? They found that 58% of surgical patients were prophylaxed appropriately, according to the guidelines, and about 38% of medical patients were getting appropriate pro prophylaxis. And then Kucher did a study and said, hey, what if, what if we tell the doctors that they're not doing the right thing? What would that do? And he found that he could actually increase the use of prophylaxis and reduce the risk of clots um, significantly by that alert. And that's how these models came to have uh, to be formed in our hospital systems. But what about you as an outpatient physician? What if I'm doing outpatient surgery? What if I'm going to a surgical center that hasn't implemented these risk assessment tools? Uh, Dr. Caprini made this model available online and it's cited here, and it comes in three versions. You can do the desktop version, the, it can be on your mobile device as an application, or it can be a printable. And basically what it does is you can go online and check all the boxes, click through the screen, and it'll do a risk assessment for you, and it will also tell you what the re current recommended prophylaxis would be. This is very helpful to my patients because I see a lot of chronic uh, DVTs, and so I give this to them, and I actually give them this to use for their family as well, because if you have a blood clot, everybody in your family's risk, everybody in your family, their risk also has just elevated. Um, the other thing that we've been able to do in some of the clinics here is part of your preoperative assessment, on top of talking about the diabetes, on top of talking about the heart disease, what if you put in a, a perioperative risk assessment for uh, a suggestion of what their clot risk is. Um, I've talked to residents across Michigan and you know a lot of people are in a rush to check people into the hospital. So sometimes they click the boxes, but maybe don't understand all the risk that goes into it. Um, primary care docs really have the opportunity to voice their opinion through their preoperative assessment. And that is heard by anesthesia and is heard by uh, surgeons. So we know who's at risk. We know how to prevent it. Let's talk about what if it happens anyway. And so the American uh, College of Chest Physician Guidelines for DVT um, said that we really need to divide this into three different categories, provoked, unprovoked, and cancer patients. And provoked patients, we recommend treatment for, with a factor 10A inhibitor for three months. Um, after the three months, they recommended you check a D-dimer, especially for men who have a higher recurrence rate about one month after treatment to make sure that they're not recurring. Um, and we'll talk about the recurrence a little more detail down the road here. For unprovoked clots, they said, well, treat for three months, of course, but then if the bleeding risk is low, consider continuing long-term anticoagulation. And that's a grade 2B recommendation. Um, and if the bleeding risk is high, then, you know, just do the three months. The reason for that is because if it's unprovoked and you don't know what caused it in the first place, how do you know what will prevent it in the future? Um, and so it's difficult to make that assessment uh, and feel comfortable with any certainty that they're not going to reclot here uh, without the anticoagulation. And then finally, cancer. Uh, low molecular weight heparin was preferred over can uh, in cancer patients. What about superficial phlebitis? You know, when you send a patient in for a DVT study, do you know if your hospital even looks at the superficial veins? Do they comment on the risk of clot? Um, the reason I ask is because the, you know, most of the uh, eye cable uh, criteria don't include a superficial risk assessment. I'm gonna show you this patient that I saw. He had a superficial clot. This is his leg, looks pretty normal. This is a superficial clot. This is the clot going through this perforator, going through the perforator into the deep vein and into his uh, posterior tibial vein. And so this gentleman actually presented with a superficial clot that had extended into his deep vein. This happens about 10% of the time, by the way. And so if you're just doing a clinical diagnosis, um, without that ultrasound, it's difficult to know. You could also send them to a hospital and they might say the DVT study is negative. That Unless they comment on the superficial vein system, it's not clear whether or not they've checked that. For segments greater than five centimeters in length, prophylactic doses of anticoagulation were recommended for 45 days. That reduces the propagation risk and the risk of it going into a deep vein thrombosis. And phlebitis uh, within the small saphenous vein extending to two to three centimeters of the deep system, either in the greater or small saphenous vein, anticoagulation was recommended. <clears throat> 
What about iliofemoral thrombosis? If you see this gentleman in your office, again, here's my buddy. Uh, he comes in with a painful uh, white uh, leg. It's called milk leg. It was first described in pregnant women and postpartum women who have the highest risk of clot. Actually, for that first six weeks postpartum, if you're treating somebody with uh, who's pregnant with clot history, you want to at least extend that for that six weeks postpartum. But in this guy, we saw this iliac vein occluded. Here's the artery. We're pushing so hard to try to get this vein occluded to see if there's any flow uh, that's actually compressing the artery. So this gentleman had uh, the femoral clot. This is him before lytics, and this is him uh, post stenting. Um, and so you can see after he had lytic therapy and a stent place, look at the return to normal in that man's leg. Here's another patient that presented to our clinic uh, with a standard blood clot. Uh, this gentleman not only occluded his deep vein, but occluded his whole superficial saphenous vein as well. And in doing so, then he had a painful white leg, and this actually can progress onto limb loss. So again, these are patients that you don't want to manage uh, at home. Uh, you want them to be sent in and evaluated by uh, cardiology does this. Um, Inter interventional radiologists will assess this, but iliofemoral clot need not be managed as an outpatient. You really need to see if they're a candidate for lytic therapy and get that open. If you had a second episode of VTE, um, life extended anticoagulation is recommended irregardless of the risk. And the question becomes, should this uh, category be divided further? Um, maybe it should. Should it be looked at as provoked or unprovoked uh, since they carry different risks? Uh, was it provoked by surgery, a medical problem, a hypercoagulable state, a cancer that's resolved? Uh, does proximal versus distal clot matter and residual thrombus? These are all topics for discussion and all things that we're presently looking into in my clinic. What about uh, pulmonary embolus? If you have an acute pulmonary embolus, you can send these patients home if they're low risk. Obviously, the acute patients should stay and unstable patients should get lytic therapy. Um, but what about this inpatient versus outpatient pulmonary embolus treatment? Uh, once this was suggested, some follow-up studies were done to indicate that really that we're not doing this very often actually. The average cost of a pulmonary embolus per day is $8,000. And the average emission for a pulmonary embolus is five days. It would be a billion dollars a year in savings if all low-risk patients were actually managed as outpatients. About zero to 15%, depending on what study you read, and there's several out there, 15 or less percent of eligible patients are being managed as an outpatient. And management is really based on risk stratification. So how do you, how do you know if it's safe? It is anticoagulation for pulmonary embolus is safe if there's a low risk of death, they're otherwise fairly healthy, there's no requirement for oxygen, they're not on narcotics, um, they don't have recent bleeding history, the vitals are all stable. And here's, this is important. There's normal mental status, good home support, and can return to the hospital quickly if there's clinical deterioration. Uh, also, you want to know that there's absence of uh, additional DVT burden. How do we know that it's safe? Uh, the Pulmonary Embolus Severity Index was published in 2005. It was endorsed by the American College of Chest Physicians and the European Society of Cardiology, and it's really the gold standard still to this day for risk prediction. It's a little complicated, um, so they did do a modification, but basically you add up points. And the gender, cancer, lung disease, blood pressure, temperature, all these things go into it. You tack up the points and then you end up with a class. Class one and two are considered low risk where the risk of uh, mortality is 3.5%. All the way up to group five, the risk is somewhere around 25%. So the low risk, which is group one and two, technically could be managed as outpatients. To further, this is another study that would be of interest if you're, if you're there, like to read the actual literature about it. This took uh, group uh, one and two patients and it randomized them either to outpatient treatment or inpatient. They had similar demographics, similar sizes. They found that the recurrence was one in the outpatient. The major bleed risk was two. There was one death in both groups, but statistically there was really no difference in the, in the outcome for either group in this study. This just gives further uh, credence to um, the fact that we should consider this as outpatient management. There was another study that looked at the role of troponin um, and that maybe troponin is actually a better indicator. So if people have elevated troponins that they're undergoing some heart strain that those that group 
would be better served in the hospital. That has not made its way into that assessment score, but that's an independent uh, variable that should be looked at. So if, if you have a clot, then what are your options? Obviously we know about low molecular weight heparin, Coumadin, um, the direct uh, oral anticoagulants, uh, and then we'll go through aspirin. So low molecular weight heparin is a prophylactic medication, reduces the risk of symptomatic and asymptomatic clots by 70%. This is much more significant than heparin and it has much lower bleeding rate than heparin, uh, 3.8, and this is the minor bleeding risk versus 5.4. The advantage is that it can be used once a day dosing and once a day dosing at 40 milligrams has been shown to be equivalent in terms of its protective um, effects uh, versus 30 twice a day. Um, and then the less you dose it, the less risk you have of heparin induced thrombocytopenia. Then when we talked about treatment for this, uh, they compared one milligram BID to 1.5 milligrams per kilogram Q day. And you'd think, wow, I'm given one and a half times the dose, what's the bleeding difference? And they found that, no, actually those are pretty similar. The major bleeding rate was 2% across the board. And, two, and when I say major bleeding, major bleeding is considered a hemorrhage that's uh, life-threatening or requires transfusion of two or more uh, units of blood. And then what about in renal patients? What about in obese patients? It's actually been studied and low molecular weight heparin is perfectly fine to use up to 150 milli, uh, kilogram patients. Beyond that, heparin assays were recommended because the effectiveness has not been studied. And again, here's a chart for your um, use that if you have patients that have renal insufficiency, you can still dose Lovenox, you just have to dose adjust it. And so instead of giving 40 milligrams once a day, or 30 milligrams twice a day for prophylaxis, they ended up just doing a once a day dose or the uh, total dose for the actual treatment was reduced to one milligram per kilogram uh, once a day. So it is possible to use it um, in these patient groups safely. What about low molecular weight heparin as a bridge? This is one of the things that I can't emphasize enough. You know, we see patients in two categories on blood thinners. One category is I have a fib. I'm looking at a 1% stroke rate per year risk. And so I'm looking at a lifetime reduction in that risk by using uh, the anticoagulation. And so if you stop uh, Coumadin, for example, and you're unprotected for five days, that's five days you're unprotected. That's manageable. The difference with a blood clot though, is if you take a patient off the blood, uh, the blood thinner, you're usually taking them to take them to surgery, which is a provoking event. And so you leave them unprotected unprote and then you poke at them, poke the bear, so to speak, and you actually incite inflammation and stasis in those patients. And so those patients really need to be treated uh, with a Lovenox bridge. And just to talk about vitamin K again, you know, the reason for vitamin K causing this hypercoagulable state uh, also is important that it, because protein C and S are a shorter half-life, proteins, um, these are inhibited first when you start Coumadin. And it's not until your INR gets up in the two range, 1.75 to two, that the other factors are inhibited. So you actually, when you start Coumadin, make a patient a little more hypercoagulable. And that's why, um, that's why that bridge is so important. Uh, it, low, uh, Coumadin has been used in prophylaxis. Um, there were some studies looking at low dose Coumadin, uh, which was an INR of 1.75. Uh, although there were a few studies that had some shoddy evidence that that might be better than nothing, um, I think we have really good alternatives. And so nothing in the literature recommends use of um, subtherapeutic uh, Coumadin. But let's compare that to the direct inhibitors um, because that's really the issue, right? So the, the Eliquises and the Xarelto's of the world and Pradaxa actually beat out vitamin K for a couple of reasons. Their ma major bleeding risk was much uh, less sig significant. So 1.8 per year versus 3.1% per year. Uh, fatal bleed again was reduced here. The rate of intracranial hemorrhage was reduced and stroke and embolus risk was the same. And so a lot of, a lot of data, and these are some of the studies that were done to verify this information, but a lot of studies show that people on vitamin K swing high, they swing low, when they're too low, they clot, when they're too high, they bleed. And so getting that stable 
uh, amount of anticoagulation is really, really beneficial for the patients. Let's dive into those a little bit more. Uh, so we have our factor 10A inhibitors, um, that's Eliquis and Xarelto. These inhibit both free and bound factor 10A. Um, and then Pradaxa is an actual th direct thrombin inhibitor. The trials that support the use of this start here, uh, apixaban in a low dose, which is 2.5 milligrams twice a day. In the advanced trials was compared to Lovenox 30 milligrams BID. Then it was compared to Lovenox 40 milligrams BID. And then it was compared for a long-term. So they did a 10 to 14 day trial and then a 35 day trial. And they found that Eliquist um, was not inferior uh, to uh, Lovenox. And so this really became uh, a nice way to, to do prophylaxis and it was first approved in knee and hip surgery patients. The treatment for blood clots with Eliquis is 10 milligrams uh, BID for seven days and then five milligrams BID following. Um, that data was collected in the AMPLIFY trial conducted from 2014 to 2017. And it said there's actually a lower bleeding rate with Eliquis and a lower recurrence rate. So again, eliminating the highs and lows with the Coumadin uh, was really beneficial. Sorelto as a prophylaxis comes in a 10 milligram dose. Again, this the record trial compared 40 milligrams to uh, of Lovenox to Zarelto and showed that there was a slight increased risk with Rivaroxaban, um, but it wasn't inferior completely. They followed it up with the Magellan study uh, in medical patients and showed that 10 milligrams for 35 days was associated with re a risk reduction uh, for patients, uh, the medical inpatient hospitalized patients uh, compared to the Lovenox. They did show a slight bleeding risk increase. They went on to look at uh, Zarelto as treatment for DVT as a one, uh, one medication dosing. Um, they found that if they did 15 milligrams BID for three weeks, followed by 20 milligrams, and they compared this uh, to Lovenox followed by warfarin, they found that uh, it was not inferior to Coumadin. With Pradaxa, the Renovate study looked at Pradaxa as a prophylaxis. They started the medication um, after total knee or hip surgery uh, about one to four hours after that surgery at a dose of 110 milligrams, and then they went to 220 milligrams daily. Um, these trials then also looked at the role of Pradaxa, um, Pradaxa's use for treatment of DVT. You do require five to 10 days of uh, parental anticoagulation, and then you can switch over to 150 milligrams BID. So we have the RECOVER trial, the REMEDY trial, and the RESONATE trial that all support that. So the big, the big worry always though was one, these were expensive, but two, what if you do have a major bleeding risk? What do we do? And so a lot of work went into developing reversal agents. So the factor 10A inhibitor is Annexa, um, this is a recombinant factor 10A, which binds the factor 10A inhibitor. So it actually binds the medication and allows that native factor 10A to go in and restore thrombin generation. This medication works within minutes of its administration and is a little pricey. It's uh, estimates 25,000, I've read up to 48,000, depending on how many doses you need. It's a temporary solution. Um, so it works for about four hours, but typically they find that that's a significant amount of time to reduce any of those major bleeding and it can be redosed. Pradaxa, uh, that is reversed uh, by Praxbind and this restores thrombin activity, again, by binding the actual medication itself by binding Pradaxa with a 350 fold higher infinity than, it, than uh, Pradaxa binds to thrombin. And it doesn't affect the anti other anticoagulants, um, which is helpful. Um, and I think this is one of the reasons we're seeing Pradaxa be prescribed more is it's a lot less expensive, actually. And you know, when you're reversing these agents, these people were on a blood thinner because they had a clot. And so you, the risk of these is that they can clot again. So the fact that Pradaxa, you, know, you can start to re-anticoagulate them with other things um, is helpful. This is um, from May 2000. 
uh, 19, this is the reversal. These are the clinical guidelines uh, for how to reverse those. If you're on this medication and you're not bleeding, hold tight. If you're bleeding and it's life-threatening, and again, and life-threatening means uh, I'm gonna not make it, or I need to have a major surgery, those reversal agents can be used. The role of aspirin, I promise we get back to this. Um, remember how we were talking about that platelet and that growth and how platelet, platelets uh, give off P-selectin and P-selectin recruits leukocytes and the leukocytes get all these inflammatory mediators involved. This creates more thrombus and post-thrombotic syndrome. So what does aspirin do? Blocks this platelet effect, blocks this P-selectin effect. And so aspirin is recommended now in patients who have unprovoked clot, especially in those who, are, uh, who decide to stop anticoagulation. Um, because aspirin is not as effective as prevent, in preventing recurrent P than the other anticoagulants, it's not considered um, proper therapy if you're truly worried about a blood clot. Um, I'm sorry, my screen just stopped. There we go. Uh, these are studies that were done on aspirin. And what they did is they treated these patients with their medications, either warfarin, rivaroxaban, uh, Eliquist, or uh, Pradaxa. And then they did follow them up with aspirin. And they found two of the three studies found that there was about a 41, 42% risk reduction in the risk of recurrent DVT after standard treatment for three months. Um, there was the re reduction about 40% if they stayed on uh, aspirin after. So a summary of the risk reduction with the anticoagulants, uh, aspirin, those studies were done with a 100 milligram dose, uh, showed a 30 to 40% risk reduction. So if you have a low risk patient, giving them aspirin uh, still has a reduction in the risk of clot. Xarelto and Eliquis and Pradaxa are in the 70% risk reduction range. So if you have a higher risk patient, you need to bump up your game a little bit. Low dose Xarelto and, low, and this dose of aspirin have about the same bleeding rate, um, just so you know. So you can bump up someone's protection when needed uh, without, significantly, uh, without significantly bumping up their bleeding risk. So these are the doses, this is the risk reduction. Here again, we talked about that low intensity warfarin or subtherapeutic warfarin at 1.15. That was about a 60% risk reduction in the best studies that were out there. If you put people on full dose anticoagulation, you're looking at 90 to 96% risk reduction. It's not 100%. So people can still clot on the medication. It's unlikely. So here's a summary of your anticoagulants uh, for your review. And here are some special factors, special diseases that might lend you to use one versus the other. So number three, okay, so we know how to treat them now. It's three months are up, what do we do? So the long-term anticoagulation, we're talking about the unprovoked clots, we're talking about the second episode of clot, we're trying to balance that recurrence rate versus that bleeding rate. And when we talk about bleeding, we're really talking not, you know, nosebleed, we're talking major bleed. And a major bleed is, is, is uh, you know, described as overt bleeding greater than two grams per deciliter or bleeding that requires over two units transfused or it occurred at a critical site or caused death. So the major bleeding rate is increased 2.6 fold if anticoagulation is con continued beyond three months. This was per the CHESS guidelines in 2000. Uh, this was published in CHESS in 2012. Again, meta-analysis reported major bleed rates of 0.45 per 100 patients and fatal bleeding rate of 0 0.14 per 100 patient years. That's a harder statistic to wrap your head around. But what I like to think about is, well, what about my patient? You know, I don't want them to have a recurrent clot. Um, I don't want to miss that. And I know there's a lot of reluctance to keep people on long-term anticoagulation. So when I looked at this, the, the risk of first year risk of recurrence when it's provoked by surgery is 1%. At five years, it's 3%. So the annual rate for that provoked by surgery is 0.5%. So you can feel pretty confident that, you know, if I stop that blood thinner after three months, they have a pretty low recurrence rate. And obviously you watch them for symptoms. If it's provoked by a non-surgical factor, look at the change. That is a 5% first year recurrence rate. At five years, it's 50%. That's a 2.5% change. And if it's the first 
unprovoked clot, now our rate is 10% first year recurrence, 30% five year recurrence at a 5% recurrence rate per year. Second unprovoked, you're looking at 15%, 45% at five years and a 7.5%. If you have active cancer and you take them off the blood thinner while they have an ongoing malignancy, your risk of recurrence is 15% at that year. I apologize that this moved over. For pulmonary embolus at six months, your recurrent rate is 8%. At 12 months, it's 13%. At five years, it's 23%. And at 10 years, 30%. So to me, when you divide it into these different categories, the change in risk becomes significant for recurrence. So we dove into that a little bit and says the highest risk of rates of recurrence occur in proximal unprovoked clots in pulmonary embolus. And these are some studies that really truly stand behind that. Another thought is, well, if there's still clot in the vein, should that really influence the decision to keep them on anticoagulation? Presently, no follow-up ultrasounds are recommended. You could just blindly stop the anticoagulation at three months. Um, and so three studies were reported here. One showed a positive correlation. One showed it did not predict recurrence. The third one showed it was not associated with an increased risk. And so these are some studies that were done with pretty, pretty big numbers. And so presently, the ultrasound follow-up is not recommended. Um, I follow up on all my ultrasound people to get uh, all my DVT patients with a follow-up ultrasound for a couple of reasons. One, I want to make sure that we uh, have the information so we can study this in more detail. Two, I need to talk to the person who, after you have a blood clot, you go talk to your family and all of a sudden you find your family history changed. So that helps influence if we should do a hypercoagulable workup or not. Um, and so hopefully these are topics that over time will collect more data to be more uh, clear about what, what the recommendations should be and what should factor into our decisions about keeping them on long-term anticoagulation. What we do know, and this is published from Up to Date, which is a great resource for this, risk factors for bleeding with anticoagulation therapy and the estimated risk, there's a very clear way of estimating risk. So they're low risk if they have none of these things present. And the risk of bleeding then at three months is 1.6%. Annual, 0.8%. So if your risk of developing a blood clot is only 0.5%, but your bleeding risk is 0.8%, I would argue that maybe in the unpro or excuse me in the provoked group, we don't need to anticoagulate them beyond the three months. If they have one risk factor, the bleed rate is 3.2%, 1.3%. If they have high risk factors, you're looking at a bleed rate in the first three months of 12.8% and uh, annual bleed rate of greater than 6.5%. And so all of this really needs to factor into how do we treat these patients? Again, if you look at a patient with cancer, even though their bleed rate is high, I think you still need to consider with a 15% recurrence, you still have to look at the effects and the, the benefit of long-term anticoagulation. There are a lot of models that are already validated for the use of anticoagulation for atrial fibrillation, these are a few of them. Has blood is a calculator, goes through some risk factors. Um, improve is for inpatient risk model to help assess the risk. Um, so this is helpful when you're making the decision for long-term anticoagulation in atrial fib patients. We do not have anything that's been validated like this for venous thromboembolic disease. And so again, this is another topic that uh, can be explored. So we covered a lot of things. I'm gonna stop here um, and leave it open for some questions. Um, I'm happy to entertain any questions you might have. Well, Laura, thank you very much for uh, an absolutely amazing coverage of such a wide, wide topic. So we have some really uh, great questions here and I will just start with uh, one which is from Rena. Rena says she's a pharmacist and had a young, healthy 25 year old male come with a 18 centimeter gastroc DVT. When she asked the physician who had sent the patient to the pharmacy, hey, do you need any further investigations done on this patient? The physician said, no, the patient is just unlucky. How would you have treated this patient specifically? Would you have gotten any other uh, relevant history or uh, investigations done on this patient? Eight, 25 year old, 
healthy male with a 18 centimeter gastroactivity. Thank you for the question. I think that leads us to the hypercoagulable state um, discussion. Uh, this is one of the great debates in the Venus literature. Um, to do a full hypercoagulable panel is about $4,000 worth of different studies. And about 50% of the time, if you test unprovoked deep vein thrombosis in an age bracket less than 40, about 50% with that $4,000 panel, you're gonna find something that's positive in there. So the debate is, what do you do? So do you test them? Or do you say, hey, listen, the fact that you had an unprovoked clot means that you're committed to lifelong anticoagulation. So I don't think a further investigation at that moment when they're on anticoagulation is needed. But the second step in that is that three months, what do I do with that three month timeline? Do I do a hypercoagulable workup? Do I do a selective hypercoagulable workup? Um, so I tend to see those patients back um, because Again, the literature suggests if it's an unprovoked clot that I need to look for malignancies. The current recommendations are that you make sure the health screenings are up to date on the patients. They don't recommend that you do like a hand scan their body or anything like that, but a, an appropriate health screening. For people that age, I'm worried about lymphomas, testicular cancers, uh, things that present um, you know, the blood dyscrasias. So those are things that I would consider as, as, uh, are as health screenings up to date. And at that three month appointment, I would take that detailed history and say, is there any other family history and maybe do a selective, um, selective hypercoagulable workup. I would not be inclined to just cold, cold stop um, that without that further investigation. If the patient said, hey, listen, I'm so scared from this, I'm gonna stay on lifelong anticoagulation, then you know, the, the decision's been made and they're gonna stay on that. When you say long-term anticoagulation, it's an annual, it's an annual process. So you can't just say, well, I'm on that for the rest of my life. You really have to review the risk assessment. Hopefully we'll have more data coming out. So you make that commitment annually. Um, but those are the things that I would consider. Thank you for that. And then another question, I think you kind of touched on that, but maybe we can give a little more clarity to uh, Dr. Bowles asks this question. F how do you compare NOAX to low molecular weight heparin? with respect to VTE thromboprophylaxis. So both efficacy and bleeding is what uh, Dr. Bowles is looking for. So that goes back to those slides, uh, the advanced trials. Um, let me go back to those for you. Um, those are all in, let me see if I can go backwards. Um, these are all in the slides, but these were all trials that were done. So the one study showed that rivaroxaban or Xarelto had a slightly higher bleeding rate when compared to Lovenox, but the rest were similar, um, similar bleeding rates and they had um, similar efficacy. And so the advantage obviously is that it's oral and your compliance is definitely better with an oral medication um, than, um, than the injectable. So the Einstein trial, so we have the RECORD trial did 40 milligrams of Lovenox to rivaroxaban for the prevention for knee and hip surgery. They found that the rivaroxaban was superior to Lovenox at the 30 milligram dose. When they compared it for 35 days, um, there was a reduction in the hospitalized patients, but there was a slightly higher bleeding risk. Not statistically significant. Um, and here's for apixaban, the advanced one, two, and three trials, they looked at 2.5 milligrams to 30 BID. They found that they were about equal. Apixaban BID for 10 to 14 days versus 40 milligrams of Lovenox. Um, it was superior to that. And again, here for 35 days, apixaban was found to be superior to Lovenox, 40 milligram dose for preventing uh, clots. The bleed rate with all of these is very, very similar. And those were all outlined in those studies. So at a general surgical level, if we were to summarize that uh, with respect to anticoagulation, the, the no acts are at least the same, probably better. And yes. from a bleeding standpoint, maybe there's a little more bleeding with the no acts, but not statistically significant. Correct. Great. Uh, one other question here is that, uh, let me find the name of the person who asked the question. This is Dr. Matthews where Dr. Matthews asks that, and you made a mention that uh, you close perforators for ulcer treatment. Uh, 
And then if a patient is to develop a DVT at a later stage and the perforator is shut down, how would the blood flow back to the heart? So perforators have one-way valves. So in a perfect situation, the deep vein is a low pressure system, right? And so in the superficial system should be a low pressure system. And those perforators, really when the muscle relaxes, it siphons the blood in through that perforator. And when the muscle contracts, the valve shuts. So that perforator doesn't allow blood to sneak back out to the surface. So when you have, it's all based on a low pressure system. When the pressure in the deep vein is high, it blows out that perforator. And so now that perforator isn't effective. Blood is actually leaking out through that perforator. So for the gentleman that we talked about, what happens is the pressure was so great in his deep vein that it was causing actual active bleeding through the pressure was causing active bleeding through his tissue. So we were able to close that. He was on anticoagulation and his deep system was occluded. Um, and so he was completely dependent on a superficial system. So we were able to treat that. Um, of course, this is after compression and every other trick under the moon had, had failed. We were able to treat that by closing that perforator that led to that spot, not closing every perforator, just the one that was causing the problem. Yeah, I, th I think that's critical to again state that these patients have so many perforators. What we close is just the pathological perforator. Mm -hmm. And if there is any reason to need a, valve, a pressure valve so that blood can go from the deep system into the superficial system, there are almost innumer innumerable perforators that would just open up and do what needs to be done there. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and uh, Laura, there's another question from Lena. Lena says she's a physical therapist in an acute care setting. Mm -hmm. What can she do to help her patients uh, from a prevention of DVT standpoint? Uh, well, that's a really good question. And we do a lot of work with uh, Merrick Freebed, which is a big inpatient rehab facility here. So there's inpatient and outpatient concerns, right? So inpatient concerns on patients transfer to the rehab centers, it was not recommended that an ultrasound be done to determine the DVT risk or if they had a DVT upon transfer. And oftentimes when they transfer from the acute setting to the subacute, you find that clot two to four weeks after their hospitalization, right? So that's right in the prime time that they're in that um, rehab setting. What we were able to do is look at the risk reduction um, in doing a $200 ultrasound before those transfers in the high-risk patients. And we developed a model to look at those high-risk patients. So those high-risk patients are 50% of patients that had a stroke will have an asymptomatic DVT on the affected side. So stroke patients were getting a unilateral ultrasound to screen for that. So what we were able to do is detect those before the patients come in. The second thing is that asking your patient in an outpatient setting, what's your blood clot risk? Have you ever had a blood clot? What are you taking for prophylaxis? Do you have any calf pain? Do you have any swelling? Those are important questions because you know the, the home and sign and the physical exam findings are not always present. But I think at least asking the question and saying, what is your anticoagulation? What is your history? Are you having any calf pain? Are you noticing any swelling? Um, I think those are questions that are pretty simple to answer. And if you have a concern, I think it's perfectly reasonable for you to send those patients to back to their doctor or you know, to one of our doctors and get an ultrasound. You know, when you're looking at the cost of an ultrasound, to, it's very minimal compared to these humongous procedures these folks have. And so to give you that confidence, I think that's fair. That's a fair ask if you have any of those symptoms. Laura, we'll take one last question in the interest of time. This is from Kelly. Kelly says it's scary that the minimal required imaging from imaging requirements from the ISC do not include calf veins and superficial veins. What do you recommend for referring physicians who are unaware? Well, I think it's a good question to ask um, what the protocol is at the institution you're dependent on uh, for the information. So in the past, they just had to do proximal, so they wouldn't look, proximal means popliteal and north of the popliteal. So they weren't looking always at the gastroc veins and the calf veins, uh, the posterior tibial and uh, the peroneal veins. Um, our ultrasound includes all of that. So there's a minimum that's required by the different associations and then each hospital puts together their own policy. Uh, 
So in our clinics, you know, if I see a superficial um, problem, I'm going to scan the superficial veins. And so what we take pride in doing is we first look at all your deep veins. Um, and if we, if that's all negative, then we do what's called a free venous screening at Center for Vein Restoration. And what we do is we look at those superficial veins and we give you an idea on that screening. Is there anything going on uh, from a reflex perspective that would account for swelling and pain? Uh, meaning, do they have venous insufficiency? Should we do a venous insufficiency study? But also we ask the patient where your pain is and the probe goes to the spot where it's painful. And so you can rest assured that we're gonna make a comment on our ultrasound reports that that was done. So I think it, it's, it's really surprising when you look at different institutions. We're in Michigan and we have seven different areas that we cover. And I would say that all seven hospitals are completely managed differently. And the amount of information we get is completely dependent on the technician that does that study and the information that they transfer to the radiologist that reads it. The difference with us is we're gonna, I'm gonna look at the study. I'm gonna scan it myself with the, with the ultrasound tech. So I think knowing who you're referring your patient to and knowing what their protocols are will really help you feel confident in that information. Yeah, I, I just cannot agree with you more, Laura. The treatment of venous insufficiency, guys, is now an entire field in itself. Just like you choose an orthopedic surgeon and you choose an orthopedic surgeon who just does orthopedics and doesn't on the side do cardiology or do something else. And similarly, you select your vein physicians as people who are specialists in the field of phlebology. Those are the people who will really take good care of your venous patients. Uh, needless to say, if you have a center for vein restoration close to you, we will take good care of your patients. But it just what we would like you to do is send your patients to people who take venous disease seriously. And uh, before we close today, I do want to introduce the, the next speaker here who would be, you know, Dr. Luis Barajas will be talking on November 19th uh, at 6.30 p.m. Now, as I said, uh, Dr. Kelsey has covered an extremely large topic. She's done an absolutely amazing job in the short time assigned. Now we will take little by little each topic. And next time we're gonna talk about superficial thrombophobitis go into the details of that and give you all plenty of time to discuss this, ask more questions. Laura, thank you for an absolutely amazing job. And we look forward to seeing you guys on November 19th. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much everyone for attending tonight's CME through our new uh, CVR Venus Exchange. Please be sure that you complete the survey link that will be coming through in the chat. We'll be sure to follow up in the next 30 to 60 days with your CME certificate. And again, thank you and have a great night.